Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know what part of the day you are watching this, but we are here. The first edition of our international uh, speakers on HR Fest Online. Hello, 2021. And we have a, a great guy. I'm so happy to have because uh, because he's very, very similar in what he thinks about HR and, and he do he does all kinds of, of absolutely amazing stuff. Lars Schmidt, hey, hello. Yeah, hey, it's good to be here. Hey, can you shortly introduce yourself because you do it much better than I am. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm the uh, I'm the author of uh, Redefining HR, a, a new book. Uh, I'm also the host of the Redefining HR podcast. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Amplify that does HR executive search and uh, HR strategy consulting around the world. And uh, I also write for uh, I cover modern HR practices for Fast Company. So I've been in the space for a little over 20 years, uh, both in-house operator, consultant, entrepreneur. Uh, author, podcaster, all that uh, fun stuff. So basically, I've just uh, I, I geek out on modern HR and people practices, and I try to spend as much time as I can uh, exploring them and talking to leaders that are moving the field forward. You know, when I prepared for this uh, interview, I, I went through a lot of your podcast, went, read a lot of your posts and and your your homepage, and 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 you do all so many interesting and exciting stuff. Uh, so it's amazing, and congr congratulations. But first of all. Every one of you, everything you do, it, it just radiates enthusiasm and energy. And uh, and how, how, where, where does it come from? Why, why are you so interested in, in HR and in this uh, revolutionizing HR and the, the new HR? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it, you know, it's a space I'm really passionate about. Uh, I was very fortunate, you know, early in my career to have some incredible mentors that, uh, that you know, kind of trained me on the value and the impact of great HR and, and how that's transformative for, you know, employees lives for companies profits and business and how it's all interconnected. And so, you know, I kind of grew up on that kind of HR and I got really passionate about it. And then I got very interested in furthering that because I also realized that not all HR operates in that way. Not all HR operators think in that way. Not all HR operators have been exposed to those kind of leaders and those kind of mentors and those kind of practices. And so it from there, it kind of became a personal mission of mine to, to get involved in projects that um, they kind of scoured the earth for modern practices and operators and shined a light on their work. And so, you know, my view is, you know, I have this unique kind of um, position in the space where I've, I've got an incredible network and I'm able to, to lean on that to kind of identify and spotlight modern practices really with the aim of, other practitioners being able to discover them and get inspired by them, take pay, you know, replicate their practices, right? Make it easy for them to do good work. And so that's really what uh, is a big driving force for me. Uh, I'm in this business as well. So it might be uh, because I'm reading a lot about this, but do you also feel uh, that, that HR is becoming hotter and hotter every day? And, and what, why is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm biased based on my work, but uh, yeah, I do. I mean, look, I think the field of HR is going through massive shifts and changes, and it, its evolution is increasing. And so, I think that if you look at uh, if you look at the field of HR, you know, uh, five years ago, right? For the most part, it was an insular field. You know, meaning people, you know, moved into HR for whatever reason early in their career. They, uh, you know, they came in as an associate, then they moved to a senior, then they moved to a manager and director, and you had this linear career path. But oftentimes people, you know, started in HR, stayed in HR, never worked anywhere else. And, you know, that was a limiting factor for our ability to innovate and, and uh, you know, approach things differently because so many people had only worked in HR. Fast forward to today, that's absolutely not the case. From the CHRO all the way down, you've got lots of people moving into the field of HR from other disciplines, data scientists, marketers, uh, engineers, product managers, designers. And so that influx of new experience, uh, thinking, discipline, practices, values uh, has really you know, changed HR fundamentally for the better. And it's, it's accelerated our shift towards really being more of a vital business function that's focused on people. And so absolutely that's changed and it's continuing to do so. And I mean, you know, going through what we all went through collectively in 2020 with COVID, um, you know, now we're in the space where, you know, that has really pushed many organizations five steps forward, 
um, in terms of you know thinking about remote work and employee flexibility and and how you support employee well-being and employee experience and it's just uh, it's really brought uh, HR and people operations to the forefront of conversations around how do you build an effective business you know not just how do you make sure people get paid or how do you make sure people get benefits or hire people some of those older perceptions of what HR could do I think that the the expectations of what great HR can do are much broader now. Absolutely. And and uh, full of many questions. First, so so what is going to be the future of HR? I hate this question. It's such a such a bullshit question. Uh, yeah. And we are talking about that since since years. And uh, you know, where is the, the place of HR in the management team and all this kind of uh, point? It, it seems like pointless uh, rounds of discussion. But but now it, it feels like there is there is a momentum which can be sized by the, some of the HR people who, who are who are clever, and uh, isn't it? And and if you ask, what do you think? Where will this role evolve? So so what? Because now we saw a lot of new possible roles in the last one year yeah. that could be taken by HR. What do you think is is really the future of HR, or what are the futures of HR? Because there is not one. Single yeah. Role. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think that, uh, you know, as you know, and your audience knows, like we, we've been talking about this idea of the future of work for years, right? And, and I've always, um, it's been part of our common vernacular, but I've it's always made me cringe a little bit because in my mind, I think we talk about future of work, uh, we're abdicating our responsibility to make changes now, right? It's like, well, in the future, we're going to be doing X or Y or Z. And I'm like, no, like companies are doing that now. Like let's let's work in real time. Let's think about what we can be doing to make an impact right now. And I think again, you know, COVID was a huge catalyst for us to accelerate a lot of our practices and our thinking uh, around how do we build work for the way uh, in, you know employees want to work today, uh, business works today, society works today. And so I think if you look at how HR will continue to evolve. Um, I think we'll continue to become more and more sophisticated. I think you'll see, you know, right now, you know, in, in my Redefining HR book, uh, I'm largely focused on what I frame as probably like the top 10% of the field. So kind of the, the real modern progressive operators and spotlighting their practices. Um, I think it, as, you know, in the coming years, that's not going to just be the top 10%. That'll be the top 20%, 30%. I think more and more companies are going to be you know, orienting themselves towards those more progressive practices. Um, and in doing so, you know, they're going to they're gonna shed some of those legacy stigmas of HR as a administrative function, personnel function. Yes, those kinds of teams still exist and they will for the near future, but it's becoming a smaller subset of the overall field. And so I think as we continue to grow and evolve, uh, you'll see more roles, you know, the, the role uh, head of remote is a relatively new position that now is exploding. I mean, lots of companies are hiring a dedicated person on their people team to just look after how they're structured for remote and distributed work. Uh, you know, employee experience is another area that we that we are thinking a lot that's growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, people analytics, you know, another area that's growing by leaps and bounds. Um, communications, right? I think the ability for CHROs and CPOs and, and HR leaders to effectively communicate. And, and I don't just mean like, craft a good email. I mean, really think about a message that's going to connect and then and then also how you deliver that message to your employees. And it's not the same way to all employees, right? Some people prefer receiving messages in different ways. And so uh, there's another element, I think, as well of uh, personalization that you will begin to see more of in HR where, you know, our, our default is uh, one size fits all. Right, we we craft a policy and we expect every employee to work within that policy. You know that's going to be harder and harder for us to do if we want to attract great talent because as we have more organizations that are distributed and remote and you know and, and you know the idea of a typical nine to five workday is also changing. Right, it doesn't really matter when you work; it matters what you deliver. And so you know that that's going to require much more personalization than HR has ever dealt with in the past. And so I think you'll start to see personalization roles uh, as well coming up within the HR team that can help uh, you know, kind of make some of the, the policies and programs um, adaptable to different employees and different populations based on meeting them where they want to be met, not just pushing you know, your view of what they need on them. Absolutely. And, and I liked a lot when you said 
the one size fits all is, is over. It's, and it's true not only inside the company, but it's only true between companies because previously, you know, it's like everybody has to have an office. Everybody has to go in at nine o'clock. Everybody has to have a salary. Everybody has, you know, and now in the last year, and we are talking about these things since years, but yeah. it, it's like talking to that 10% or even, even maybe less. But now everybody kind of had to take seriously these, these boundaries. Uh, um, do you think that the HR will be, or some of the HR guys, or will those be the successful HR guys who, who can continue to, to look at these boundaries in a, in a, in a more uh, really meaningful way? So instead of accepting, you know, that yes, yeah. you have an office, everybody has to, you know, all these kind of things, they can start asking, what do we need for this particular company? How many days do we have to come in? Do we have to come in at all? All these kind of things. Yeah. I mean, look, I think one of the, one of the most important skills of HR right now is the ability to listen, right? Uh, don't assume you know what your employees need. Ask them. Uh, you know, we, 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 we're big on buzzwords in HR, right? And I think one of the buzzwords we talk about a lot right now is co-creation. Uh, how do we co-create programs and policies with our employees, not to our employees, so that we can actually understand what it is that they want and need and build programs that support that? You know, I think one of the biggest shifts in the profile of HR leaders today, particularly going back to that point I made earlier of lots of people moving into the HR function from other areas of the business is business acumen and, 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 and business, you know, discipline and an understanding. And so, you know, they're able to go and, and tackle a problem with a, a perspective of what they're addressing beyond just the traditional HR framework of what you need to address in this problem. It's, it's the, it's the business framework. It's the growth framework. And so that understanding is allowing us to realize that we, we have to be, you know, we, we have to kind of move away from those playbooks of our past where I think, again, legacy HR, we often operated from playbooks. You're going to do performance management. Cool. Here's what the playbook says you should do. You're going to do learning and development. Great. Here's what the playbook says you should do. We're throwing those away now. Like we, 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 leverage that past experience and understanding, but it doesn't mean that that prescribes specifically exactly how we have to solve problems in our organization. So I think we're becoming much more, you know, agile and adaptive in terms of the way that we think about designing programs for our employees. Absolutely. And it's so good to, to get rid of those playbooks, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that's the, so that's why that, uh, you, you, you call your book Redefining HR, n not for, is it out by the way, or it's not yet out? Yeah, it was uh, globally released yesterday, actually. Ah, uh, so, well, well, uh, well, on the day we're recording this, it, was, it came out on the 26th of January. So yeah, oh, now it's available great. worldwide. So I, I'm going, definitely going to read it. Um, so you say it's not a book, not an HR book. Yeah. That's the yeah, I mean, what, what, I, what I mean by that is I think that, you know, when you look at, when you look at traditionally thinking about HR books, you think about, uh, you know, they're valuable to an HR audience. And that's obvious, right? Like a lot of, it's, it's redefining HR. I get into a lot of modern HR practices. Clearly that's valuable to an HR audience, but it's not limited to that. You know, in my, from my lens, if you are a founder, if you're a CEO, if you're on a board and you're advising an executive team on how to build a winning company, a successful company, you can't do that without a modern people team and modern people thinking and capabilities. And so in my mind, you know, much like the field, much like HR leaders or business operators who focus on people, this is a business book that's focused on people programs and processes. And so I think what makes the book, uh, you know, relatable, particularly in that sense, is it's not, when I, when I set out to write the book, there, there's lots of, um, you know, analysts or authors or pundits, you know, who write books. And I didn't want to be that person, right? Like, obviously I wrote the book, but I didn't want it to be about me. I want it to be about practitioners doing the work. And so throughout the book, you know, I have over 60 people say CHROs, CPOs from companies like HubSpot, Asana, VaynerMedia, MasterCard, uh, Delivery Hero, you know, others all around the world actually sharing their practices. So case studies, personal essays, stories, um, because I wanted to actually, you know, allow readers, whether they're CEOs or HR operators, to not just hear a theoretical book, but to see a practical, real book with real examples of what people are doing to solve specific problems that we all face. And so, yeah, in that sense, uh, you know, the, the book itself 
is a business book. I, I, I my, my hope is that, uh, you know, obviously I know it'll, it'll get a lot of traction in the HR community. I hope it gets quite a bit of traction as well at the founder CXO board level community as well, because those are the people often who are actually in a position to resource their HR teams in a way that they need to be to make the kind of impact that the book explores. You met basically very, very interesting companies who are in the top whatever percent. So, so tell us a few examples or one, one or two that, that, that surprised you the most or, or that shocked you the most. Yeah, let me, uh, let me think on that. I mean, I think in terms of, uh, there wasn't necessarily anything that shocked me um, there, because I think, uh, because a lot of the, the conversations were people who I've known and I've worked with in the past, some that I found particularly interesting, like there was, uh, there was an example from Siemens. Um, and I think when you, when you think about innovation in HR, you know, oftentimes you think about smaller companies right? Startups, um, uh, venture-backed companies that are, are small enough where they don't have deeply entrenched and embedded systems and programs and operating systems so they can quickly move and adjust. You don't think about enterprise companies. Um, and clearly Siemens, you know, over 100,000 employees, they're an enterprise company. But they contributed a case study on uh, a, a future of work division within their HR team, which was a handful of people who were responsible for being deeply connected to the outside world in terms of where innovation was happening uh, in HR, what external circumstances were driving change, and then working across all of the different, you know, HR constituents. I think they have over, you know, a thousand people in HR, as well as, you know, uh, innovation-oriented hubs within the business to identify where they could bring some of those practices in-house. And in an organization like that, uh, you know, you you often don't just say, okay, we're now gonna, you know, this, there's this new emerging practice coming about. Um, we think it's great. So we're gonna roll it out immediately to over hundred thousand employees, right? Like nobody operates like that, but they can kind of create small innovation labs, pilot labs, test it, see if it works and if it does scale it. And so, uh, you know, it was interesting to just get it, you know, get a, a front row seat into how they approach um, that specifically with de designing a dedicated, you know, future work team uh, within the business. So that's very interesting. That's, that's, by the way, one of the most frequent questions we get, because, you know, we have all these kind of interesting speakers like you, and then usually the complaint, or I don't know, the, the challenge uh, from the HR professionals in Hungary is coming that, hey, okay, it's very easy for them because they are in Silicon Valley and they are having uh, sexy teams with lots of money. But yeah. what can I do with my factory of 2,500 people? Yeah, so I mean, look, I, one of the, you know, one of the kind of fundamental points that I, I reinforce in the book is that your budget shouldn't dictate your ability to innovate. And, you know, what I mean by that, especially now, you know, if you, if you look across the landscape right now, there are so many, um, you know, communities, resources, uh, publications, et cetera, that are free that have great content around practices and how to do X, Y, or Z. And so whether it's, you know, programs, you know, in my background. I was the, the co-founder of HR Open Source. You know, we've turned that over to board now, but that's a thriving community of over 10,000 practitioners across over 100 countries. I remember. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, your community, obviously, uh, Google Rework, um, Disrupt HR, Hacking HR, right? There's all of these, um, you know, global communities that have come up that are oriented around helping practitioners um, through peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and learning. And so you don't have to have a huge budget to have a huge impact. You don't have to have a big, sexy brand name, um, you know, with lots of venture capital funding to be able to do innovative work. I think that it's never been easier to access some of these practices that can guide and steer your work. Um, you know, obviously you have to prioritize what you do and, you know, most HR operators don't have an abundance of free time. So if you're watching this and you're like, yeah, where's that free time? I get it. But one of the things that I do stress in the book is that in today's world of HR and how things are evolving, one of the most important skill sets you're going to have is learning agility. And because the world around us is changing so fast, you have got to prioritize and defend your time to learn. And so, you know, whether it's uh, as simple as carving out an hour in your calendar each week and blocking it, right, putting it in the calendar so nobody's booking over it, and that's your learning time. And in that time, you're, you know, you're reading blogs, you're uh, reading white papers and research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you've got to make sure that you you kind of book and defend that time for learning um, so that you can keep pace. And if you do that, then you're going to discover really interesting practices that even if you're working in a factory, 
that like, oh, okay, wow, this other company did this thing. And I think, you know, that won't, that exact thing won't work here, but I can actually adapt that based on our environment and pilot it and see if it would work here. And so there's those, you know, those opportunities exist every day, but you've got to make sure that you're uh, making space and time in your schedule to learn and to keep pace with all the trends as they're unfolding. So that, that's actually, you answered my question because I, want, I wanted to ask you, but then I reformulate it in another way that, that is, it, is it great to be in HR now or is it, it's, it's a bloody mess? Because, you know, oh. <laughs> on one hand, there is all these opportunities, all these, wow, when we are talking about every, in every sentence, there is something you could take uh, years to, to really uh, take care about that. But, uh, but also the playbook had the advantage that there was a playbook, you know, and it was so simple. So, you know, the performance appraisal and, uh, you know, and then the playbook is over and, and that might make some of the HR guys uh, insecure and, uh, and, 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 you know, so how do you see the, yeah. the HR persons around you? How do they, how do they take this? Do they like it? Do they take it as a, as a challenge? Do they take it as a, a big uh, weight on their shoulders or how is it? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I personally think there's never been a better time to work in HR period. Like I just think there's so many opportunities there's so many options there's so many environments and, and you are right there. There are some people that are driven by change. They're driven by innovation. They want to be able to make an impact and do things different way and challenge status quo. And there are definitely also people who like the playbook, like the consistency, like knowing exactly where they are. And the reality is if you look across HR, there's space for both of those people right now. Not everybody has to be, you know, that innovator person who's always, you know, challenging conventional wisdom and doing something new. There's lots of organizations that, uh, that are still, you know, driven by more traditional practices that do rely on, on more of that kind of formulaic playbook thinking. And so there's room for both of those to exist. Both of those will exist well into the future, because again, you do have a lot of organizations that, uh, you know, they, they prefer to have more of that traditional, you know, transactional understood HR operations then kind of pushing the boundaries, but you also have a lot of companies that are pushing the boundaries and want to do things differently. So to me, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the context of my point that there's never been a better time uh, to work in HR because wherever you're most comfortable, there's a place for you. That's true. And it's going to be very, very interesting to, to, to watch what is going to uh, develop because there will be huge battles in, in the management rooms, I think. Yeah. And there will be big successes and big, big, uh, tragedies so yeah I, yeah i think so i mean look uh it, it, you know when you look at hr and who we deal with and what we do i mean we're dealing with people right it's the, the most volatile asset that a company has and so there are there are no you know you may you may have a great idea and you may have great plans but it's it's how those get received and and adopted by you know your volatile asset of your employees, and you you know you can't always predict that. So yeah, it's it's always going to be interesting. True, and you know I told you uh, I, I'm coming from marketing. That that's that's the second marketing and HR is a two uh, fields where everybody thinks they understand it, and everybody has a great idea about uh, how to do it better than the marketing director or the HR director. Um, so that's very exciting to hear. So okay, I am a let's say a 20 year old or something like that uh, young student. I am interested in HR. I am nearing the my term in university. What do you propose me to do? Um, so the first thing I would do is build a what I call a learning list. So uh, you know the great thing about the time we're in right now is that there's a lot of um, you know I, I cringe the, the term thought leader and I don't use it personally, but there's a lot of people that are doing uh, very interesting work and are writing about it, podcasting about it, uh, doing videos about it. So build a learning list of influencers in the space whose voice and work and perspective you admire uh, and learn from them, right? I think that there's, there's you know, when, when you're, you know, especially I, and I you know, I say this because I did this myself when I was kind of coming up and I was getting more involved in social and digital engagement. Um, I was like, you know, okay, I want to, you know, here are the 20, 25 people who I admire their voice and perspective. Uh, you know, at that time, lots of people were using Twitter. I built a Twitter list with all of them. And then through them, I was like, okay, what are they reading? Um, who, what research is, uh, matters to them? Um, what are their controversial perspectives that might be counterintuitive to common wisdom? And through following them, 
I was able to see like who they followed and who they read. And so I ended up being able to build a really robust global network of leading thinkers in the space, you know, through that initial smaller group. And so, and that helped accelerate my learning tremendously. So, you know, leverage social media, leverage Twitter, leverage LinkedIn. Um, you know, these are platforms that a lot of the people that you can learn from are actively using right now. And, um, and so I would, I would use that, you know, kind of approach social media, like your classroom. Uh, and then I would say, if you're, you know, getting ready to graduate, think about the kind of work you want to do, and then do some research on the kind of companies that are doing that kind of work. Um, right. And so I think that those are two steps. The third piece I would just say is, um, especially early in your career, you know, you're often taught to build subject matter, um, experience and training and yes, you do need that. Um, but another area that I would put as, you know, on par um, in terms of prioritizing is your network. Uh, your network as your career expands will probably be the single most valuable thing that you have. And so don't leave that to chance, you know, consciously curate it, build it, expand it, um, put effort into it, right? Make sure you're being valuable to your network, you're giving back, you're supporting wherever you can. Uh, and that network will pay dividends for you down the road. Also, you know, and this, this is probably uh, more at the, you know, not at the very entry level part, because there you're trying to learn as much as you can about the field. But as you progress more and some more of like the, the mid-career operators who are watching right now, um, I would also say like now that your network within your skill, you're in, within your domain is established, begin to branch outside of HR, right? Look for other areas that interest you. Maybe it's design, maybe it's product management, maybe it's uh, scrum and agile, maybe it's engineering, maybe it's marketing, right? Whatever the discipline is, find people outside of your discipline that you can also learn from them because, you know, that's where a lot of tremendous learning and growth happens is where you start to take those practices that aren't HR practices and bring them into your work. Uh, and then you can start to have, you know, X orders of magnitude and impact differently because you're approaching uh, a problem set in a different way. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you. So, so you propose to be in HR all the time, or is it a good idea to, to jump a little bit, to try this for a few months, a few years, or, or, or even between HR? So you should be a recruiter or specialist, or, or you should try everything? Yeah, I would say, like, most importantly, don't lock into one, especially for recent grads, right? If you're just coming out, like, nobody really knows what they want to do for the rest of their career uh, at 20. And, and you shouldn't, right? And, and I think if you, if you are approaching your career very locked into an idea, like in five years, I see myself doing X, you're going to cost yourself opportunities. So go into the thing that you think you're passionate about as other opportunities present themselves, even if they're outside of HR, be open-minded to that because that, that exposure and that skill set. I've talked to lots of people, CHROs and CPOs specifically, who've done that exact thing. You know, they maybe started in HR, they took detours in other areas of the business, uh, then moved back to HR. That made them a much more well-rounded uh, HR executive. And so, um, you know, absolutely, if those opportunities present themselves and there's something that's of interest, uh, you know, definitely don't be afraid to take that. Don't be afraid to step out of HR to come back into it. Or maybe you won't come back into it. Maybe you'll step out and you'll be like, oh, wow, this other thing is definitely what I want to be doing. It's not HR. That's okay too. So, you know, don't uh, have some flexibility and fluidity with how your career evolves. Don't lock into one. Uh, don't, don't ever fall into that trap of like, in five years, I want to be doing X. Nobody knows that. I don't know that. I can't tell you what I want to be doing in five years. I've been in this space for 20 years. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you don't, don't cost yourself opportunities to grow uh, by, by locking into something that, you know, you think you probably want to be doing because, you know, take it a year at a time. Also, I think, yeah, it's, it's so true what you say. And also it's, it's a bit, these, these silos are going to disappear also. Like there, there will be less clearly an HR person and the marketeer and a salesperson. It's, it's going to merge and there, there will be HR type of roles that we now call HR in marketing and in sales. And, you know, so that's going to be awesome, I think. Yeah. Uh, last question. If you would have done this interview 10 years ago, then you would be in a business suite with the tie and I would be... <laughs> suite in a time with, in an office and you would be in an office and now instead of that it's so much cooler to have all those interesting things behind you that's a bit uh, <laughs> that's a bit describes what is happening so what are those tell us uh so these are all skateboards uh, that i've uh, accumulated over the year you know when i uh my, my i'm in my home office now doubles as my podcast studio 
Uh, when I was first setting that up and kind of designing the artwork, um, I had a few skateboard decks from uh, Movember. So I've been doing Movember, you know, growing a mustache for charity for 12 years now. And so when you hit a fundraising target, they would give you a custom skateboard as a, as a thank you. So I had a few of those and I've, I grew up skating. I've always loved you know, skate culture. And so I, uh, I, you know, I had those and then that collection kind of grew. And so if you look over my shoulder, you know, this one is from November. Uh, this is the Screaming Hand and the Mike Valley deck next to it, which are uh, real boards that I used to skate when I was a kid. Not the actual boards. These are, you know, recreations because obviously they don't have any scuffs or scratches on them. So, uh, but yeah, I just, uh, I appreciate uh, skate culture. And I also wanted to have, I mean, again, you talk about contrasting what we're doing now versus 10 years ago. Um, you know, for me, these skateboards represent me, right? This is my personality. This is my style. I'm not an overly corporate guy. I'm not a stuffy suit and tie guy at all. Um, and I'm okay with that. I, I'd I'd much rather be who I am and allow people who uh, respond to that, be attracted to it. Maybe some people feel that I'm not corporate enough and they're going to be repelled by it. Both of those outcomes are great. Um, you know, by me. And so I think that especially as we look at now where so many more people are, you know, working remotely, this idea of a corporate persona and a personal persona as separate personas is, you know, that's kind of legacy thinking at this point. Like we're all just people, uh, you know, and we should be able to, you know, show up as we are and show up as ourselves and, uh, you know, be accepted for that. So. Absolutely. And also true for companies, isn't it? So instead yeah. of every company looking like the perfect company with all the most awards and the best office and, the, you know, instead of it's so, so cool or it would be so cool if every company would tell you the truth, you know, like we are a bit sloppy, but we like to party. We are, we are <laughs> money, but you have to work like an idiot. So, yeah, look, I mean, look, uh, and it goes, you know, I'm, I'm an employer branding guy at, at heart. I mean, uh, great employer branding attracts and repels. You don't want to be the right company for everybody. You want to be the right company for the people who actually align with how you work and operate. And that means, you know, sharing your awards, saying like, yeah, here are the cool things that we offer, but here are the things that kind of suck and are difficult about working here. And so if, if those things are very detrimental to how you work, we're not the right place for you. And that's okay. Like you want people, you know, the goal should be helping people make the most informed decision they possibly can. And so, uh, yeah, that applies to this as well. Yeah, so I, I love a lot the, the, the kind of word you painted for us. I'm happy to be in that. We are going to cover it, that's for sure. And uh, I hope that this energy you have, even maybe with the skateboard, we will see it uh, in person next year. Uh, and you can energize uh, a lot more Hungarians than, uh, than just with this video. Yeah, well, hey, you, you, you promised a, a lake and a beach. And uh, yes, yes, so yes. If, I, if I see a beach and water, I'm, I'm, I'm down. The alcohol and all the stuff I cannot tell you. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. It was it was a good discussion. I I had a lot of uh, interesting things, and I hope our listeners uh, had a lot. We are going to to talk about your book on our uh, surfaces. So if anybody is interested, then then they, can, they will be able to find you, and then hopefully they will see you next year, and then there can be further contacts uh, and further inspiration. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, thanks so much for having me on and uh, appreciate all your listeners making time for this or all, all your viewers, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Sa safe uh, everything. Have a great evening and uh, ciao, ciao. Yeah, sounds great. You too. Take care. Mm -hmm.